Often whenever the subject of Sega comes up, it inevitably leads to the conversation about their failures. Failed systems, failed games, and even failed peripherals and add-ons. Well, not in this episode. Here we are going over some things that Sega actually got right. Big and small, these decisions and choices benefited every Sega fan involved in some way. Let's take a look at 10 times Sega got it very right. Say what you want about the Master System and its games, but you just have to admit those plastic cases made your collection look so much better. Not only that, but it provided a great level of protection as well. Almost every kid I knew had loose NES cartridges stacked around their systems, while the Master System kids, admittedly far fewer, had a nice shelf of neatly arranged plastic cases. This design was so good, Sega stayed with it well into the Genesis and Mega Drive era. The look and feel of these games gave Sega a unique aesthetic that set it apart from the other brands at the time. It felt premium, almost exotic in a way, and still provides a look and feel beyond the paper boxes and loose carts of the time. It was a simple choice that really added to the mystique of Sega ownership. When Sega designed and released Virtua Racing for the Genesis in early 1994, it included the SVP, or Sega Virtua Processor. It was meant to bring vastly superior polygon capabilities to the system, it otherwise could never have done, and capable of as much as 20,000 polygons per second depending on the usage. It even gave the Genesis two additional audio channels to play around with and was capable of texture mapping. Sega had intended the SVP to be a standalone product to give the aging platform a boost towards the end of its life. As a dedicated product, this likely would have been no more than $50 or so, a much cheaper alternative to the later release 32X that could have been in consumer hands half a year sooner. The original vision for this product was exactly the route Sega should have gone in my opinion one that would have not created an in-house competitor for the Saturn, and one that was much cheaper and easier to use. Unfortunately, Sega shelved the standalone SVP product and never used the chip again. In 1993, Sega released the six-button arcade pad for the Genesis and Mega Drive. This controller was in response to the rapid rise in popularity of fighting games thanks to Street Fighter 2, as well as games coming from newer platforms such as the Super Nintendo. Its sleek design was a perfect fit in your hands, its directional pad perfect for shoot 'em ups fighting games and platformers, and its six-button face giving you access to everything you needed right there on the front of the pad. I fell in love with this controller the instant I used it, and it's backwards compatible with the vast majority of games released before it. This controller was so well designed, Sega decided not to mess with a good thing, and based its Saturn controller directly on it. It changed the shape a bit and added a couple of shoulder buttons, but is an otherwise faithful evolution that was again great for pretty much every 2D genre you could think of. It's still one of my favorites today, and a must-have for every Genesis owner. Discussions surrounding the Sega Saturn rarely go far from its complicated hardware and performance in the West, but one area Sega hit a home run with the Saturn was its awesome lineup of first-party peripherals. Sega themselves had two fully analog-based controllers on the market for the Saturn in its first year, the Arcade Racer Joystick and the Mission Stick. Sega was also keen on getting a light gun on the market for the Saturn that was accurate and well-made, producing the Sega Stunner, known as the Virtua Gun in Japan. These were modeled after the same guns used in the arcade for the Virtua Cop series, and were found in both the standalone and pack-in configuration. Sega even released the Shuttle Mouse, a point-and-click device that was not just used for its internet software, but also could be used in quite a few games, including the aforementioned Virtua Cop series. 
first-party devices would flow from Sega regularly during the Saturn's run, including save memory cartridges, 3D analog controllers, arcade sticks, and even the lovely twin-stick controller that gave you a true arcade feel for Virtual On. Every one of these were well-made, fairly priced, and added a new dimension to the gameplay of already great playing games. I recommend every single one of them. On September 9, 1999, Sega unleashed the Dreamcast in North America. This launch was for all intents and purposes a massive success story for Sega, garnering huge media attention and hype within the gaming community. Sega got so many things right here, the entire episode could be easily based solely on that alone. But to sum up, Sega launched the system at a mere $200, an absolute steal for next generation hardware. It had a full-fledged Sonic title, as well as a big return of their Sega Sports football brand. Third parties were there with huge releases like Soul Calibur, Power Stone, and Tokyo Extreme Racer, and Sega had plenty of stock ready to go so everyone who wanted one could get it. The variety in games was impressive as well, giving gamers the choice of everything from story-driven adventure games, fighting games, sports games, racing games, and whatever the hell Pin Pin Triicelon was supposed to be. The Dreamcast would never have a chance due to Sega's financial issues and internal shakeups, but that 9th of September in 1999 could not have been much better than it was. The price was right, the games were there, and it was a glorious time to be a Sega fan. When the Sega Saturn was released in the US in May of 1995, it was a shock to pretty much everyone outside of Sega. It was four months early and it was $400, two things you'll often hear the most about. But the other surprise was that Sega of America decided that the original Japanese pad was simply not what the US gamer wanted, so they went ahead and redesigned it, made it bulkier, changed the directional pad, and even the shoulder buttons. This controller, in my humble opinion, sucked, and was a disgrace next to the Japanese design in every single way. Unfortunately for my European cousins, they too would be cursed at the launch of their Saturn with this heinous design. Luckily, Sega realized the error of their ways and dumped this joke in 1996, packing in the Japanese-style controller with every new round-button Saturn released from then on. This sloppy excuse for a pad would slip immediately into obscurity and never be seen again. During the holiday months of 1996, Sega was in pure desperation mode in the US, having its ass handed to it by Sony and its PlayStation. They needed something radical to help spur the sales of the Saturn, so they launched the three pack-in promotion nationwide starting in November and running it through the end of the year. This pack was comprised of Daytona USA, Virtua Fighter 2, and Virtua Cop, three games meant to draw the attention of gamers that had seen these games in the arcade or perhaps a favorable review in a game magazine. The success of this promotion was immediate and saw sales surge for the Saturn 500% during the holiday period. I remember a few places even being sold out of the system for a few weeks, something I had not seen before or after the promotion ended. This promotion single-handedly sold at least a few hundred thousand pieces of hardware, and Sega even announced a press release praising its success. It was a brilliant move that was perhaps a little too late to change anything, but yet still responsible for the creation of many new Saturn owners. Sega kicked production into high gear so hard for this that you could still find new sealed copies of this promotion years after the system was dead and gone. The Master System lived a storied life in the 1980s and 90s. Depending on the region you lived in, it was either a bomb you never played or a daily part of your gaming existence. The history of the machine is quite something, and you could spend lots of time just explaining how it fared in each region. The part of the story that is often glossed over was Sega's decision to upgrade the core hardware in the SG-1000, thus creating the Mark III, 
known to most of us as the Master System. This move would allow the platform to compete strongly against other 8-bit systems of the time in various regions, and last well into the 90s despite the availability of 16-bit platforms. Nothing would save it in North America, but she was a force to be reckoned with in other areas, and thanks to its technical prowess, spit out games that sometimes looked almost 16-bit. The original blueprint for this device would never have been able to achieve that same level of success. When the Sega Genesis launched in 1989, Sega of America pushed sports games as hard as they could. Better looking, better sounding arcade experiences that were promoted by some of the top athletes of the time. It was all over the box of the system, in magazine ads and TV commercials. Sega was the place for sports games, and Sega pushed this message the entire life of the machine. Even third parties jumped on board with this messaging, and EA created an entire brand based on it. The messaging was a huge success, and helped drive the Genesis sales during its ascent in 1991. Whether it was football, golf, basketball, soccer, or boxing, Sega Sports had you covered from the earliest days of the platform. This messaging was of profound importance as the Super Nintendo hit the market, covering every aspect of gaming with a level of variety you simply could not get anywhere else. It's one of the biggest reasons the Genesis brand was so popular in North America, and Sega only got better and better with each new addition to its sports franchises. It was a move that can't be overstated, and a huge reason why the Genesis was the success it was. Most people cannot fathom just how long the Sega Genesis was on the market before the Super Nintendo ever showed up. For two years, the Genesis was available before the real 16-bit war even began. It had already wiped the floor with the TurboGrafx-16, and was providing hours upon hours of great gaming to me and my friends. But as good as those days had been, and as incredible as games like Revenge of Shinobi, Eswat, and Castle of Illusion played, mass market success eluded Sega for that entire two years, with the platform selling only about 1.5 million units. The NES still dominated the US video game market, and Sega was basically still building and repairing its reputation after the disastrous Master System run. It was right around that time that the Super Nintendo was about to come to the US market that new Sega of America president Tom Kalinske decided that the platform needed both a price drop and a new pack-in game to sell any real numbers, and thus one of the best strategies ever devised was implemented. Sega packed in the new Sonic the Hedgehog game that was getting rave reviews all over the industry, and dropped the price of the hardware $30 down to $150. This move was backed by an aggressive advertising campaign that painted the Genesis as the system to own in 1991, having both a larger library as well as more horsepower than the slowdown riddled Super Nintendo. It all paid off too, and the Genesis would outsell Nintendo's new 16-bit platform 2 to 1, doubling the Genesis installed base in a short amount of time. This move was so successful that Sega would ride its wave of hype for years, never achieving similar success on any of their other platforms. Danita Stokes, president of HAG. It's bad enough that Sega Genesis has the most 16-bit games, but this new Sonic the Hedgehog, oh, he really dumped my doilies. They say he's incredibly fast. Well, what's the hurry, mister? Hmm? And about his attitude. Smarty pants. Why can't it be more like that nice boy, Mario? Oh, oh, oh. little brat. New Sonic the Hedgehog, only on the 16-bit Sega Genesis system. Sega was the kind of company where any real discussion about their history ultimately leads to the hows and whys they failed as a hardware maker. It's easy to lose sight of the things they did well, however brief or small they may have been. I like to think that being a Sega fan was like a roller coaster ride. Sometimes you were happy as could be, your family and friends along for the ride, and sometimes you were sad that the inevitability of the path you were on must come to an end. I am glad I was there to experience each of their platforms, and if they ever decided to try it again, I'd happily get on that roller coaster one more time. I'm Sigalord X. 
Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.